times took their ideologies and their beliefs and their principles and their methodologies from people outside of Islam, then likewise these three individuals, this is exactly what they did. This is exactly what they did. And I want to just give some illustrations at this point. Obviously this is an area of detailed research. All of the evidences are present. But just for the purpose of this lecture, I want to just give a few examples just to make the point. So for example, if we look at Sayyid Qutb, Sayyid Qutb was a man who was heavily influenced by another person, by a, a French philosopher called Alexis Carroll. He's a famous French philosopher. And Alexis Carroll was a Christian, and Sayyid Qutb was very well read in this individual's books. And one of the main ideologies that this person has written in his books is that he's speaking about the Christian society. And he mentions how the Christian society in this time, meaning in his time, had basically become barbaric. They'd, they'd basically re, 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 return back to a type of barbarism. Like the, and, and this, this word here, barbarism, in Arabic, it's actually jahiliya. So a Christian is speaking about the Christians in general in his time, and he's describing them that the society as a whole is like jahiliya, as we would describe the Arabs prior to the time of uh, the coming of the messenger, that they were in jahiliya. So this Christian Alexis Carroll in his books, this is a theme that he mentions often and he develops. And it is established that Sayyid Qutb was heavily influenced by this individual. And so then what we find is that in the books of Sayyid Qutb, what do we find in his books? Milestones, fi dhilalil Qur'an, in the shade of the Qur'an, and all of his uh, tafsir. What do we see? We see the same ideology. We see him bringing the same ideology. He now takes the ideas of Alexis Carroll and then applies them to the Muslim Ummah. So we find from, from some of his statements, we don't need to go through all of them, but just in meaning that he says that verily, the, the Muslim people today have reverted to a jahiliyyah that is worse than the first jahiliyyah. And he makes statements like this, that the whole of mankind have become apostates from the religion of Islam. And he, he, he develops this theme of jahiliyyah, that the jahiliyyah, the general jahiliyyah, has returned again. Where did this come from? This came from a Christian philosopher. Right? And this is just one of his ideas. There are other ideas as well, like revolution and you know, uh, a violent revolution against the rulers, toppling them. All of these ideas have their origins in the, the, the philosophers of that time. To such a degree that even those uh, people from the non-Muslims who are researchers and who are honest and who are shrewd and who know their history, even they themselves have written in their books that this ideology that Sayyid Qutb propounded in his books has more in common with the ideologies of Marx and Lenin, than it does with Islam. Right? So even these non-Muslim researchers have come to that conclusion based upon their research. That's Sayyid Qutb. Likewise, with Hassan al-Banna. Hassan al-Banna, when we look at his organization, I mean, there were many influences that came to him, but it's established that the Muslim Brotherhood had connections with the Nazis from Germany. Rather, they actually met with each other and you know, visited each other. And when you look at the you know, the various organizational structures that Ikhwan al-Muslimin had in terms of like, they used to have like boy scouts and things like this and, you know, like units within the organization. All of that was just borrowed and copied from the Nazi youth, the, 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 the National, National Socialist Party from, from Germany to, to such a degree that they even had the same types of uniforms for their, you know, like the boy scouts and so on and so forth. I mean, there are many other things that I can mention, but I'm just trying to give quick illustrations and quick points here so that you understand that these movements and the ideologies that they came with, where did they come from? They actually came from the prevailing ideologies and philosophies of the non-Muslims of that time. And likewise with Maududi, Maududi was likewise influenced by the revolutionary ideologies that were, that were present in the writings of, of the philosophers from the previous century. So in his books you find, he says things like, that the, that the reason why the messengers came was to basically topple the rulers and establish the rule of Islam. And he develops this theme of uh, uh, like a violent, revolutionary uh, uh, resolve on behalf of the people in order to establish the Islamic, Islamic uh, state. What do we find? 15, 15, 20 years earlier, we find the, the communist revolution and we find in the books of all of these philosophers the same ideas. So the point that we're making is that these three individuals were heavily influenced by these external ideologies which came from the non-Muslims, and then they, 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 they implemented them and integrated them into their teachings, and then they began to write books. Then they began to use verses from the Qur'an. Then they began to use hadith from the sunnah to justify these ideologies. And then we find, just like in the early times, don't we see now today how the beliefs of the Ash'ariyya and the Mu'tazila and, the, and, and you know, the, the, the aspects of the belief of the Qadariyya and the belief of the Murajiyah, don't we find them present today? Of course we do. Because, we, because what they did in those times was to write books. 
and to spread, you know, to spread this, these innovations so that they flourished and became spread and widespread amongst Ummah. What do we find today? The same thing. The same thing. To such a degree that today, so, so what, what happened is that due to these influences of these individuals, the principles of the sunnah, the methodology in the sunnah, as it relates to how we deal with the rulers, they became destroyed, and they became wasted, and they became forgotten. And this was because due to the spread of this organization from Egypt to the Arab countries, and eventually when they began to come to the Western countries in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and they brought with them uh, the books and translated the books and so on and so forth, due to all of these activities, we found that these ideologies of al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin, they became widespread amongst the Muslims, up until this day. To such a degree that if you were to walk in the street and just ask any common Muslim, say to him, Akhi Muslim, why do you think that the Muslims are in the condition that they are today? The first thing that he will say to you, most likely he will say to you, it is because of the corrupt rulers. They are the problems. Right? So this is the degree to which these teachings have become widespread and become ingrained in the mind and the thinking of the Muslim. Right? Because of, because of these reasons. And so therefore... And likewise, this Ikhwan al-Muslimin, when they spread, we found many different splinter groups, Jama'atul Jihad, Jama'at, uh, the Jama'at of uh, Takfir and Hijra, like in Egypt, and you had groups like Hizb al-Tahrir, and you know, all of these different groups are basically the same, same in the origin, but they just have differences in how they fulfill their objectives of establishing, as they claim, an, an Islamic state. So this was the second thing that I wanted you to understand, that... Now that in the current time, just as the Salaf mentioned that you know the Sunnah will 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 you know be, be, will will be removed bit by bit up until a person can't even recognize the, the religion. This is how it is now. If you if you look at the how the Muslims are thinking, you will find that they attribute the reasons and the causes for the problems of the Muslimin and the splitting of the Muslimin to something which is completely different to what is in the Sunnah. Completely different, as you will see when we look at the principles in the sunnah. So I'm hoping then, inshallah, that from this introduction, you can at least now put some perspective and understand the situation that we are in today and where these ideologies came from, who were the individuals responsible for this. And now we want to compare and contrast what is, what is written in the books of these people. And I mean here the books of Sayyid Qutb and Hassan al-Banna and Maududi. And likewise, all those people after them, up until this day, who are promoting those beliefs, like Osama bin Laden, like the groups of Takfir, like the, the likes of Hizb tahrir like individuals like Abu Hamza that we have in, in the UK, and um, this Abu Qatada, and all of these individual, in, in, individuals, Muhammad al-Mas'ari, and Sa'ad al-Faqih, and all these people who are, who are propagating this batil and this falsehood, we want to, as we read through these narrations from the Sunnah and from the Salaf, and we establish these principles, I want you to com- compare and contrast between what has been revealed by Allah upon the tongue of His Messenger and between what is propounded by these innovators and by these deviants who are misleading the Muslims with their false ideologies and their beliefs. So, this now leads me to the main part of my lecture, which is 11 or 12 principles from the Sunnah regarding the affairs of the rulers. So, first of all, we begin by mentioning the time before the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did it used to be? In that time, we find that all of the, the, the Arabs were basically in separation. They were separated from each other, and they, were, they differed with each other, and they would also uh, uh, fight with each other and have mutual boasting uh, 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 with respect to each other. But we would find that the strong tribes would come, and they would devour the weak tribes. And every single tribe would basically try to find any opportunity to attack and engage in a war with another tribe. And this is how it was. And then Allah sent the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Messenger was concerned with uniting them together, bringing them together upon Tawheed and encouraging them together. And he warned from splitting and differing and he, you know, he made them aware of this. And when we look in the Sunnah and the Quran and the Sunnah, we find so many ahadith and so many verses which speak about this, of uniting and not differing. And likewise we find this in the speech of the Sahaba and the Salaf radiallahu anhum. Just to give some uh, illustrations of this from the Quran from the Sunnah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Anfal وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْحَبَ رِيْهُكُمْ That do not you know, dispute with each other so that you lose courage and that your strength disappears. This is an ayah. Allah prohibits from dispute and so on and so forth. Likewise, Allah said in Surah Ali Imran, the third surah, verse 105, That do not be like those who, say, who split and who differed after the clear proofs came to them. For them, 
is a very mighty and severe punishment. 